welcome to our continuing podcast series uh, on the corporate soul. This is Tyler Norton. Uh, great to be with all of you. Thanks for joining the Pat podcast and uh, hoping that you're enjoying uh, the exploration we're going on as we start to really kind of connect the dots on is there such thing as a corporate soul and how do you uh, really promote it, prioritize it, and help it to grow inside of your organization or or even in your own personal entrepreneurial ventures or in your own personal life. Um, you know that we started with an orientation podcast. Uh, I'm hoping you've had a chance to take a look at that. That that, that podcast kind of sets the stage for uh, the whole series. And we talked a lot about um, the idea of a corporate soul and the ethos of a company. Ethos meaning the distinguishing spirit of a culture, kind of the fundamental values that are peculiar to a certain group of people, a culture, or even a movement, or even a person, really. And, um, uh, you know, the, the whole essence of these early podcast sessions have been, can a corporation have a soul? Can it have a distinguishing spirit that ultimately repre uh, represents it well? Uh, in an environment where, honestly, I think the financial motivations and, and imperatives of companies tend to smother what would otherwise be the corporate soul. And uh, so that's what we're really talking about today. And today I want to dig in a little deeper on an idea that I think is central to the corporate soul. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to the etymology of a word, in this case, the word influence. Um, in 2020, we've had kind of an interesting year. Uh, we use these terms, the flu, flu season, uh, certainly this year with the pandemic hitting the world unexpectedly in the last uh, year. Uh, we've talked a lot about these types of things, but have you ever wondered where the word flu comes from? I think if you were to know the Latin derivative, it's influenza. But even that, like what does the word influence mean in Old Latin or Old French? And um, I think it's really instructive to, to pause and consider this. So the word influence etymologically um, its derivative comes from an astrological concept. And in the late 14th century, the way they would define influence was streaming ethereal power from the stars when in a certain position or alignment that would then act on the character or destiny of men. So influence was really, in the late 14th century, this idea of astrological, an astrological concept that, that why did some people's character or destiny turn out the way it was? And they would say it's influence. Um, but they meant it's streaming ethereal power influence coming down from the stars when they're in proper alignment or in position that then acts upon the character or destiny of a person or a man or a woman, of course. And so you say, wow, that's kind of an interesting word. Streaming ethereal power from the stars when in their proper order or position that acts upon the character or destiny of men. Well, over time, as you can imagine, I, I, thought, I sat and thought, so why did they have the flu, the common flu or a plague of some sort? Why, why did it end up being called the flu in the first place or influenza? And it's interesting to consider, well, perhaps they didn't know why certain people got the germs or spread a certain illness. Maybe a neighbor was healthy and the person right next to them ends up with the flu and even dies. And when someone said, gosh, I wonder why this person was well and this person wasn't, I think they would say it's influenza. It's streaming ethereal power or influence from the stars in, in their proper order that acted upon the character or destiny of this individual, which kind of makes sense if you think about it they would go back and say we don't know why some people got sick and died and others didn't and they would point to this concept of of influence um, when you stop and consider how we use the term today I think we kind of take the second half of the definition don't we 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 look at it through the lens of um, not necessarily streaming ethereal power from the stars in their proper place but we actually look at influence as something that can act upon the character or destiny of another person. And I was once asked if you could study like anything, go deep on any one subject, what would it be? And for me, it would probably be influence. I, I can't think of a more powerful concept, especially, of course, influence for good, 
we all know that there's plenty of influence uh, for bad or evil in the world. But um, I'm really intrigued with where influence is born. How do you increase influence? Um, if you have the ability to act upon the character or destiny of another person, as the etymological definition might suggest, similar to streaming ethereal power from the stars in their proper alignment or position. What if we are the stars now? We are the streaming ethereal power that comes down and acts upon the character, character or destiny of someone when we're in proper position. That is to suggest when we intersect with or are in orbit of someone else's life. By the way, what does that have to do at all, if at all, with the notion of corporate soul or, or ethos or the defining spirit of, of an organization? And I, I think it has a lot to do with this. And, I, and this is kind of what I'd like to talk about today on today's podcast, which is uh, the idea of where does influence come from? How do we create greater influence how do we promote greater influence in the organizations that we're in, whether it's a small team, uh, whether it's a, a small group of people gathered together really with any common objective, or a large corporation uh, and anything in between. So heralding back to the 14th century definition, streaming ethereal power from the stars when in their proper orbit or place or, or order, uh, you know, what is it that streams from us that can create greater influence and impact? Um, now, a word about how this connects to Corporate Soul and the whole premise of, of our podcasting series. Um, corporations, while they are bodies, as we've discussed in terms of the word, but the truth is they're really groups of people. Um, they're in, in the sense of the Marine Corps, C-O-R-P, uh, corporations are like that kind of a core. They're a group of people, and we know that anything we can do to promote the human spirit and promote growth, development, and success in the people that we work with really should obviously align with and promote the development of uh, the corporate soul. And um, over the years, I've really been intrigued with this notion of, so how do we promote influence, positive influence, in our work environment? Some years ago, I was um, introduced to a book called Leadership and Self-Deception, that had been written by a consortium of philosophers and teachers that uh, called themselves the Arbinger Institute. And I was really intrigued with this message. And it, it had a lot to do with the concept of we have the ability to deceive ourselves as we interact with those we care about, those that we might meet for the first time today, and anyone in between. And um, they went on to write several books about this concept, and I'm going to explore this with you today on the podcast. Uh, one was Leadership and Self-Deception. They followed that up with a book called uh, The Anatomy of Peace, which I would probably rank in my top five of all-time reads. If you've never read The Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute, I would highly recommend um, that you explore this book. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I did have breakfast one time with one of the founding members of the Arbinger Institute some years ago. Um, but I think both of those books actually were born from a, a smaller work that was simply called The Choice. And this was a, a volume that outlined what I would call a series of truths. Um, certainly, uh, these are philo philosophers and, and, uh, and business consultants and human consultants that help people in terms of organizational behavior work well together. But um, when I was first exposed to this, I really found that it kind of explored and unpacked where influence came from. And I'm going to try to summarize it for you today with an invitation that you go out and if you're intrigued by it or think it might be helpful, um, whether in your family or in your business or with your colleagues, to, to go out and really explore the concepts as the Arbinger Institute promotes them. I, I, in no way do I want to suggest that I do it better than them or, or uh, have a hold on everything they teach, but I'm just going to share kind of my own interpretation of what they've taught and how it's in, in, in informed and, and impacted the corporate soul and, and kind of personal ethos journey of my own life. Um, it starts with the concept that um, what we do has uh, is disconnected or dislocated in some ways necessarily from more of our way of being. So the whole essence of this is that you have your doings, if you will, 
the behaviors that we do on a given day, but there's something deeper than just the doing and what we do each day that is worthy of exploring and understanding if we want to be effective and have high influence on others for good. And they approach this through the concept of way of being. So think about doing and being and kind of putting the way of being underneath the way, uh, the way of being underneath what we do or, or our doings or behaviors. And there's really several different uh, ranges or varieties of doing, right? We can all be doing lots of different things. But um, the Arbinger Institute promotes the concept that there's really only two ways of being, regardless of the broad variety of ways of things we might be doing. There's really underneath only two ways of being. And the first way they would refer to as the responsive way of being, and the other they would refer to as the resistant way of being. And it's deeper than the behavior or the doing. So I like to think of this as we're either responsive in our attitude and disposition or resistant underneath all of the things we might be doing and saying. And our influence on others, which is the whole thesis of my discussion with you today, um, is really born from beneath the line of our doings. It's the influence that we might have on someone else is actually a function of whether we're in a posture of being resistant or responsive to others. So let, let's talk about each of those. So when I am in a resistant way of being, I am in fact seeing other people around me as objects. And when I'm in a responsive way of being, I see them as people. I don't know if there's anything more powerful, relevant, and meaningful in the world we live in today than this one simple concept, which is, do I see people as people or do I see people as objects? And if you went back and explored some of the earlier podcasts uh, that we've done, even the EPC concept, right? Do you place people and purpose and... and uh, 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 excuse me, people, purpose, and principles above your commitment to ego and economics. There's an interesting relationship if somebody's placing people, purpose, and principles ahead of ego and economics, there's a pretty good chance that they're in this responsive mode. That is to say that they're likely seeing people around them as people and not necessarily seeing them as objects. And, um, it's kind of slippery as you start to explore this, but let me let me kind of see if I can't help you go a little deeper on this as we discuss this. So we all kind of on a given day are interacting with people inside of our organizations and our homes and families, and there's a thousand choice points we have to decide if our way of being is going to be resistant, again, seeing someone as an object, or responsive. And to reiterate the notion that our influence right? No longer streaming ethereal power from the stars in their proper place uh, that acts upon the character or destiny of someone else. But actually, we become the power source. We can have an impact on those around us. Streaming ethereal power now coming from us that acts upon character or destiny in the form of influence. And the Arbinger Institute would argue here in a lot of their writing that influence is determined by whether we stand in a resistant posture, seeing others as objects, or if we're being responsive to the needs of others. The choice points that are around us all the time speak to the fact that we live and interact with people. Going back to my concept that corporations, while they're bodies, right, you could also say so is the Marine Corps. It's a body, right? It's an organization. And so our corporation is nothing more than a group of people, a core of people, if you will. And um, how we have influence on one another oftentimes is determined by our way of being one with another. That is, do you see the people you work with or for uh, as objects, or do you see them as people? Well, throughout any given day, the concept is that we see and understand the needs of others around us. As a person, right, I know what it's like to be a person. I know what it's like to be stressed. I know what it's like to be behind the ball or working hard on something or having a challenge or a need. 
And as such, like I can see you and I can sense, do you have a need right now? Something that I can be helpful with. Uh, and these moments when we have this sense to see others needs and then respond to them are these choice points that they talk about that live around us. And they would suggest that our responsiveness to someone else's need, our ability to interpret it, to sense it, see it, feel it, and then respond to it, seeing that person as a person, is really at the deepest sense of right and wrong for us. I mean, this is like moral philosophy at the most fundamental level. And when we choose to betray ourselves and not respond to that need around us of someone else, we begin to see that person not as a person, with real hopes and fears and concerns and challenges and a reality, right? We begin to see them as an object. And the second we choose not to respond to their need, and the second we decide, you know what, their need is less important to me, we actually begin to see them as an object. And as such, we really don't think their needs are real. And while this may be a little slippery, I can help you see it with some examples in just a minute. The idea is that if I don't see people that have real lives, real concerns, real needs around me, they start to become almost an obstacle or in some regards a vehicle to be used for my purposes. And so this idea is where are we in our relationship to others around us? Do we see them as people? Or do we see them as objects in service of our needs and our concerns, which are far more real to us than they are? What's interesting is when we move to a resistant posture on people, we no longer see them as people. What happens is, if we even think of them at all, right, we now see them as almost in our way or a means to an end that we think is really important. And it may not necessarily match up in any way with their vision, but we may start to see them as objects. Now, what happens in this situation? Well, he uses in the book several times throughout several of their books different examples. One simple example, and I have six kids, so I know what this example feels like, is you wake up at two in the morning to the sound of one of your children stirring in their crib, the baby. And um, you say to yourself, I ought to hop up and grab the baby and help out before my spouse wakes up. That's the moment, that's the choice point moment when you sense the need not only of the child, but you're also being aware of your spouse and the fact that there's a lot going on and maybe I can get to the baby before it might wake her or him as it, as it may be. And what ends up happening is you have this choice point moment and let's say I betray it. Let's say that I don't respond to the need of both the baby or my wife immediately in that moment, we feel a need to begin to justify ourselves. So we begin to almost horribleize or pivot our wife. For example, I might say, well, she doesn't have to get up at 7 a.m. for a meeting. I do, right? Or she's probably awake over there and just acting, waiting for me to get up. And she probably hears the baby and she's already awake. You know, so you can, you can say, or I got up last time. Like, I was the last one to do this. It's her turn or vice versa. Now, we all can kind of relate to scenarios like this where we feel or sense the need someone else has for our help. We have this moment. I wasn't horribleizing my wife or blaming her in any way prior when I felt the sense I had to hop up and help out with the baby before she wakes up. But the second I chose not to respond to that need, then I have this really natural desire and sense that I need to justify myself. I need to actually say, well, it's not my fault. You know, she should have gotten the baby down earlier or, and you start to horribleize each other. Now, there's an example that was kind of really personal to me. I was at an airport on a Monday morning and, and this is many years ago and the TSA line, the security line was just really backed up. And a lot of us were agitated because we were just worried we were going to miss our flights. And there was a mom there with three kids, um, and they were taking forever to get through security. And here's this woman holding the ba her baby. She's got two other little ones. She's pushing a stroller that she still has to collapse down and get through the x-ray machine. She's got kids, and they're all over the place. And it was really interesting. It was at a time when I was really studying and researching these things. Now, remember, I'm a dad of six, so I know what this feels like to be in an airport with your kids. But I felt this sense like I should help. And I, I was close enough in the line that 
I could have easily walked up and said something. But then, like, I found myself having this dialogue inside my head, like, what mother brings three little kids to the airport completely by herself on a Monday morning, which is historically, like, the busiest time at this particular airport? You know, she and she's making all of us late. She, we're, so I started to actually turn her into an object. Like, this is her fault. I'm not helping. Like, what is she doing here? I'm going to miss my flight. Everything was about me. By the way, when you're in this re, uh, resistant posture, you get really selfish really fast. So here I was kind of seeing her as an object of blame. Like, I'm the victim of this mother here with their kids. And I catch myself in this thought process. And, and I'm literally reading and, and trying to apply these principles. And I go, no, 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 no. This is a woman who's struggling to get her kids through security. I know what this feels like. Remember, as a person, I know what it feels like to be a person. As a father of six, I know what it feels like to have kids going to the airport. And so there was this, this kind of checking of myself. I'm not saying I'm great at this, but I caught it. And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to offer my help. Now, we would all agree that some stranger coming up with your little kid. So I said, you know, kind of a weird feeling. So I went up and I said, listen, let me get your bags for you and the stroller. You focus on the kids and I'll give you a hand. And she was really thankful. She's like, thanks so much for doing this. And I started to help her with her bags and throwing them up. And anyway, long and short of it is we get through security and she's got her kids kind of back in strollers and a little bit better settled as I'm finishing throwing on my shoes and making my mad dash to my gate. And she sees me and, sa and, and as I'm going by, says, hey, thanks a lot. Um, I'm on my way to a funeral and I could find no one to watch my kids. Uh, but a close family member had passed away and I really appreciated the help. And in that moment, like as I'm walking to the gate, I, I see this full circle coming back to me, what I'm reading and studying and realizing, yeah, this is it. Like this is how impact and influence happens. It's when we see each other as people. And while I don't want to profess or proclaim in any way that like I'm an example of this, I'm only using that as a reference point, which was why are we so quick to dehumanize one another? and to reduce the humanity around us, um, we almost kind of want to ignore the needs that we see in others. And I don't want to suggest that every person stranded on the side of the road is your responsibility to stop, or every person trying to get their kids through security. I get it, right, that sometimes we can't respond to every feeling we have to help. But I would suggest to you that if you hope to increase your influence, which I think is central to corporate ethos and soul, that you might want to start by asking yourself, do I see other people around me as people with real hopes, real concerns, real lives, real fears, or do I possibly see these people around me as objects who are less real than me, if even noticeable, and so really I don't respond to or even have any feelings about the fact that they're traveling. I'll just say you shouldn't be traveling on a Monday morning. And... Um, as I've been reading through and rereading, I've read these for a lot of years, these, this material, uh, it's been really interesting to see that every moment we really are at work or involved in teams or doing anything we're doing, we have these choice po point moments, these points of choice where we can say, am I going to see and treat the person around me as an object or am I going to see them as a person? Um, I remember the, the, uh, a story I was told when I was uh, a young man. I, in my church, I had a, a leader that was a, good in, a really good influence on me share a story. He was a missionary in a companionship in, on, on a mission as a young man with a gentleman who, uh, when he would eat, he would eat with his mouth open all the time. And, and, real, and it was like he would chew his food, and it was highly audible, and you could even see the food. And, and he was just telling me how disgusting this was to see this person eat. And he goes, I was there. I ate meals with him every day for several days. And then on like the fourth or fifth day, I dropped my knife and fork, and I looked at this person, and I said, you know what? You are an unbelievable slob. Like, I cannot believe. Do you, do you not hear yourself eating? Do you not even know that your mouth is wide open? And he just said, I let him have it. I mean, I just could not stand it any further. I was so amazed that someone could, could do this. And in that moment, um, he said his companion um, kind of softly put down his knife and fork and very humbly said, I'm really, 
really, really sorry. Um, I was born without the ability to breathe through my nose. And so um, I have to chew with my mouth open so that I can breathe when I eat. And I, I know how bad it is. It's always been something I've been embarrassed. I should have told you, but I'm really, really sorry. I'll never forget, I was probably 17 years old when this gentleman shared this story with me, and he began to weep and told me, he says, I, I, I can never forgive myself for being so rude and so insensitive to this person. I had no longer seen him as a person, right? He was seeing him as an object. And he said, I became really defensive and protective of him once I knew once I knew what he was going through. Think about my experience at the airport. Had I known that this mom was heading off to a funeral, didn't have help to watch the kids, doing the best she could, would, would my sense of desire to help her have increased, been accelerated? Would I have been quicker to move? The answer, I believe, is yes. So what that suggests is we tend to dehumanize people, and we tend to judge quickly, and normally, when we betray the sense to help someone, as this Arbinger Institute uh, content suggests, we begin to justify ourselves. And that really means we begin to horribilize them. Well, she shouldn't be here on a Monday morning. And what's she doing bringing three kids here? And all of these things, we actually start to take away from them and attack them in a way that makes it look like her behavior, I'm a victim of her. Well, you may say, gosh, why are we talking about this in the sense of corporate soul? I can think of nothing more central to building a successful culture, a successful team, than promoting the kind of humanity that helps us all to be self-aware enough to realize when we start to see someone as an object versus a person. What if I were to tell you that uh, this one of the founding philosophers of the Arbinger Institute is a gentleman by the name of C. Terry Warner. I read a, uh, an address that he gave where he talked about finally realizing this one great truth, and that is that people respond most to how we feel about them, not to what we say or do to them. Now, I'm going to say it again. C. Terry Warner, one of the founding uh, fathers of the Arbinger Institute, the lead philosopher, uh, a Yale-educated philosopher, wonderful man, said, when I realized this, I realized that people respond more to how we feel about them than necessarily to what we say or do. Now, you may say, I don't, I don't buy into that. Well, let me tell you the story that he shared to kind of uh, explore that when he realized this. It's, a, it's kind of a special story. He had three children, as I recall, but I do remember him telling that he had a small daughter that was in a crib. And the older sisters would sneak in the morning into the baby's room, right? And they were small enough sisters, or even though they were the older sisters, they were all younger children, the way he tells the story. And they would do their best to get their little sister up and out of this crib so that they could play with her before mom and dad woke up. And, and Dr. Warner tells the story that, you know, he asked his girls, hey, listen, let's, let's let the baby sleep. Um, and when you're ready to go in, if she's awake and we know she's awake, come talk to mom and I, and we'll go in with you and help you get the baby out. So he, he says it wasn't too long before he saw two little shadows of the girls kind of sneaking past his door in the early hours of the morning to get to their baby sister. And so he got up out of bed and, and was kind of frustrated, but then decided, you know what, I'm just going to watch this interaction. I'm not going to, I'm not going to over assert and influence or insert myself. And so he describes watching these two older sisters who adored their baby sister, but were not tall enough or big enough to get her up and out of the crib. And so he's watching kind of from an angle as the girls are trying to get the baby up and out of the crib. And the baby is beside herself excited, like shaking the crib and giggling and laughing. And of course, the two girls are trying to be quiet and don't want to wake up mom and dad, but they're trying to get the baby up and over the crib. And he says, I'm watching them almost like abuse this little baby, like one's reaching through the crib and grabbing her feet and the other's trying to get on top of the crib and, and, and get the baby out. And what basically ensues is they all fall to the ground together. He says, I almost thought someone was going to get hurt. 
And at the end of this, I'm thinking that poor little baby has just been utterly abused. And yet he said, I, I see all three girls and they're all laughing, even the baby, uncontrollably. And he said to himself, how is it possible that this little baby who's literally almost been thrown from her crib, like pushed and pushed and everything else, and then it occurred to him, he says, and this is the moment when I realized it, that baby was responding to the love and the way her sisters felt about her, not to the abuse that they had just done to her and almost flipping her out of the crib. She knew and could sense and feel that they cared about her. Now, remember, What's their whole thesis? The whole thesis is there is a, a level deeper than behavior, a way of being that is responsive, that sees someone as a person, acknowledges them as a real person, real concerns, real hopes, real, feel, real joys, and that sense of people respond to how you feel about them, not to what you say or do might be one of the great lost truths of all human interaction and certainly of business interactions. Because what happens is we dehumanize the people around us too quickly. There is no corporate soul to speak of. There is no ethos or defining spirit or fundamental values to a group of people that will have any enduring or durable success that does not take into account how we see and treat other people. In fact, I think the two kind of fundamental elements of the corporate soul are number one, which I spoke about in the last podcast, do you place ego and economics in your life, your own achievement and economic outcomes, greater than your commitment to principles? If you said, what is that really saying? It's how you see yourself, how you see and treat yourself in the face of opportunity, etc. And in this particular discussion today, in this podcast, how you see and treat others. So I really believe that the two great fundamental elements of the true corporate soul is how do you see and treat yourself and how do you see and treat others? And if you can get those things calibrated in a way where you're seeing the people around you as people, not as objects, not as employees to be led or managed the wrong way, but just these are people. They have homes, they have families, they have kids, they have fears and concerns. I can guarantee you, and I'll go deeper into this in some other podcasts, that if you want to increase your influence, go back to the basics of saying, how do I see and treat these people? And do I see them as, as people? Now, um, that story that he told said, led to the summary of that one concept, which is people respond primarily to how we feel about them, not to what we say or do. Now, he says there's a myth that, well, this is really soft, right? You know, if I'm responsive to someone, then I'm being soft to them. And if I'm resistant, it's hard and that you can't do both. And he goes, actually, you can do any behavior in either way of being. But the amount of influence, remember, that's what we're talking about. The amount of impact we have on the character or destiny of another person may actually be way more determined by how our heart is towards them, how we're seeing them when we administer a compliment. I can give a compliment to my wife, but I can have a resistant way of being at the moment and tell her she looks great and have it have no effect, right, if my heart isn't in the right position towards her. Or I can be seeing her as a person, tell her she looks phenomenal, which she normally does. My wife is amazing. But if I say it with a responsive seeing her as a person heart, the influence and the impact of that statement or compliment is higher. What about correcting someone, an employee that's underperforming or a child, right? Again, I'm raising a large family. I know the drill on this. If I allow myself to go to the place where I see them as an object, so I'm in a resistant posture or way of being, and then I make an attempt to correct them or to give them uh, you know, even to, to, to uh, administer some sort of consequence to them, my kids can read it like this. If I'm not approaching them with a soft heart and a heart that says, hey, listen, first off, I love you, I care about you, but we need to talk about this. And so go back to where I started. In the late 14th century, the idea was, what is influence? Well, back then, it was an astrological term that said, 
It's streaming ethereal power from the stars when in their proper position that acts upon the character or destiny, destiny of, a, of another person. Um, over the years, it moved away from a reference just to the stars, for example, and moved into this concept of if someone's had a great influence on you for good, they've acted upon your character. They've acted upon your destiny in a very meaningful way. And I think all of us could sit down and make a list of people. We would say, this person had a massive influence on my life. I've taught this all around the world. And one of my favorite exercises is to ask, so who's had a big influence on you? And people will say coaches and parents and grandparents and all sorts of people in their kind of circle of influence. But the real significant influence comes from people that saw them for who they were as a person. Um, now, again, seems really basic, doesn't it? Is this really worth unpacking as it relates to trying to build a unique culture and trying to in, in really enliven or keep alive a corporate soul? Well, let me tell you why I think this is important, and I'm looking at the time here just to make sure I'm, I'm keeping it to, to a target time. Being responsive to other people suggests that we're aware and have compassion. You know the word compassion is a compound word, where C-O-M at the beginning, the prefix of com means together or with. Passion, actually, I think the world misinterprets the original meaning of passion, similar to like the passion of Christ, is the last several days of his life that really are his suffering. So the word passion in this sense is suffering. So to have compassion means you're suffering with someone. Compassion plays a role in your influence. That is to suggest that the greater compassion you have for someone else, whether it's a mother with three kids scrambling to get through security in a busy moment in an airport, uh, or it's a person that can't breathe through their nose when they're eating and has to breathe through their mouth, uh, and you, you have a different sense of awareness as to who they are as a person and what they're dealing with, you're seeing them with compassion. And the second you introduce compassion, into the approach that you're taking with other people, your influence for good exponentially increases. So let's ask ourselves, what, what role can influence play in a corporate environment? Does it inspire, increased, or improve performance? No question. Absolutely no question. Just productivity alone, performance and productivity alone, small incremental increases in productivity across a broad range of players can have a massive return on investment. Now, I'm not trying to reduce this to just an ROI, but I am saying these things may feel soft. They're at the heart of human interaction. And one of the primary reasons I believe corporations that can have a soul, and many who say should have a soul, actually don't. And it's because what ends up trumping, what ends up taking over is the financial imperatives. Give me the number. Deliver what you're being asked don't really care about your home life. I don't care about what's going on with you personally. Do your job. Well, when that tone starts to come across, even if we don't say it, remember, people respond primarily to the way we feel about them, not necessarily just to what we say or do. If my wife and I are having a fight and I give her a kiss on the cheek in the morning <clears throat> and then say, you know, I love you as I'm walking out the door, if that's not coming from a place of a responsive, seeing her as a person with real cares, concerns, hopes, fears, and even frustrations, then my I love you that morning might as well be as hollow as a dead tree. It doesn't really have any value. If I'm seeing her as real, her concerns, hopes, fears, frustrations, and challenges as real, that is to suggest I have compassion for her and I'm seeing her as a human being, then in that moment where I extend my embrace to her and say, hey, I love you before I leave, can have an extreme influence, can act upon the character or destiny or day of that person. In a work environment, I think we far too underestimate uh, what this really could mean in terms of building a corporate soul. Now, we've got a lot to get done. Business and work are all about being productive. It's always about, I gotta do, I gotta do, I've gotta do. I just want to suggest to you, you can be highly productive, you can give corrective feedback, and you can give compliments all from a place of responsiveness, which, by the way, later on in their writings, the Arbinger Institute simply took the resistant way and described it as a heart at war, an interesting metaphor, right? So a heart at war is I see you as an object, not as a real person, not as someone I care about. 
On the other side, the responsive way, the metaphor, as you might imagine, is the heart at peace. A heart at peace sees a person as a person and is at peace, feels a certain measure of serenity because I see you as a person and you see me as a person, and we interact uh, with that in mind. Now, what am I really talking about today? I'm talking about the corporate soul, and I'm talking about how you see and treat other people inside of a small team of two, for that matter, a marriage of two, a partnership with a handful of employees, all the way up to a large organization, all the way into a family. These are the great secrets of influence. These are the great secrets of where a soul or a corporate soul comes from. And when people begin to believe, feel, and know that you're approaching them, treating them as human beings, you'll be amazed at how much more they'll want to give to you and the organization in an appropriate way um, to drive to a common or shared outcome. Um, if the definition of leadership, one of my favorite def definitions of leadership is the art of mobilizing a group of people to actually want to struggle for a shared aspiration, the art of mobilizing a group of people to want to struggle for shared aspirations, well, that desire to want to struggle will come from how adept and how really good you are at saying, I need to manage the way I'm seeing people. Am I seeing and treating these people as people or am I seeing and treating these people as objects? And at the very heart of the Arbinger Institute is your influence, your streaming ethereal power coming from you, not from the stars, but from you, that is acting upon the character or destiny of those around you, hopefully favorably, right? That's the goal. Um, your streaming ethereal power will be determined by your way of being, not what you are necessarily doing. And in some regards, not even what you're saying. You can say something with a heart at war or in a resistant posture, have zero impact. You can say something with a, a heart at peace in a responsive posture and tone to someone else and have massive impact. So part of this podcast series for me is un unpacking, I probably use that term too much, but exploring a little bit what is it that creates a corporate soul? And in the last podcast where we talked about the EPC formula, if you haven't had a chance to see that, you should go back and watch that. There's a lot about managing self, managing my motives, how I view and see myself um, in that message, or even the notion of increasing my capacity. But if you thought of these things as a stack, right, that you're building up on them, the next major thing, in my opinion, is how do you see others? How do you see and interact and treat others? And I will suggest to you that if you really want to increase influence for good, enduring influence and impact for good, then start to explore some of these teachings about this concept of a heart at war or a heart at peace or the choice that we have on a thousand levels every day to be resistant to the humanity around us or to be responsive to it. I can't think of a time in my life, I turned 50 this year, I cannot think of a time in my life where this kind of teaching, this kind of truth, uh, would be more relevant than 2020. I think we all see around us evidence and moments when people, even really close to us, are seeing and treating us or others as objects, when in reality nothing could be more influential and impactful than if we all simply agreed that as a person, I know what it feels like to be a person. And as such, I know what it feels like to be afraid or to be concerned or to be lonely or to feel uh, excluded. And we can choose to see that and then be more responsive to the needs of others around us. If you will turn up your antenna, I think you'll be amazed to see how much opportunity there is to promote and focus on the needs of others around you. I also submit to you that as you do that, in your own corporate environment, team environments, entrepreneurial environments, or homes, what will happen is your influence will climb. I want to finish with a, a section of this book, The Choice, that I think is so powerful in the way they, uh, they talk about this. And it's, the, how do I become responsive? What is the responsive way? And it really points to a series of decisions you are going to make to place the needs of others a, as a priority in your, in your own world. 
So the, 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 the book actually says, so, you know, what does the responsive way feel like? And then it simply says, you know. It says, embrace your spouse before leaving on a business trip. Realize a wrong and apologize for it. Suffer a wrong and don't necessarily require an apology. Care about another's needs. Weep in gratitude. Cry for another's pain. Help until you want to help. Visit someone that might be in need. Call your mother just to speak with her. Correct a child, but do it with love. Have an excuse, but fail to see it. See opportunity to slack off and work harder still. Be slighted, but don't take offense. And see in the person that serves you a person that might need to be served. Look, I believe that these principles, while again, they could easily be construed as, as soft, they're not. They're at the heart of uh, high impact and high influence people. And if you want to be a person that's an inflection point, which I'm sure we'll talk about in another podcast, this idea of we can be an inflection point for good in someone else's life. I always hope that someone that intersects with my life could look back and say, things got better for me because of my ongoing interaction with or even intersection with Ty. I hope that that's how you'll see things. And while I don't do it perfectly, not by a long shot, I do know that this notion of people responding primarily to how we feel about them, not just what we say or do, is at the heart of streaming ethereal power, not from the stars, but from us, that then acts upon the character and destiny of people around us. So thanks for joining this session of The Corporate Soul. I hope you'll give some thought to how you see and treat others around you. Again, I don't think there's anything more relevant or salient right now in the worlds we're living in than this simple truth of how we see each other and how we can increase influence for good. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you soon on The Corporate Soul again. Thanks.